принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении 8 лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. On February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin shocked the world by launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. A deadly war has broken out in Europe, and it's having a ripple effect across the globe. What seemed unthinkable in the 21st century is now underway. It's a scale of war we haven't seen in Europe for decades, and it's only one man that is responsible, and that is President Putin. <laughs> Since then, more than 200,000 soldiers and civilians have been killed or injured. More than 13 million Ukrainians have been displaced. There's mounting evidence of war crimes. And there's no end in sight. Vice News has been on the ground in Ukraine and Russia, covering the front lines and the human toll of this brutal war. We've just had to run inside because of a huge explosion outside. There is a sound of bombardment coming from all around us. Oh my God, that sound is really close. This is a year of war in the battle for Ukraine. For weeks now, Western intelligence agencies have been warning that Russia might launch a full-scale war on Ukraine. But few here believed it could happen. However, this morning, after around 5 o'clock, Russia began airstrikes across the country, and there are air raid sirens going off right now here in the heart of Kiev. Thousands are racing to get out of Kiev, lining up to board trains and buses that will take them out of the city. Did you ever expect that you would have to flee Kiev with your family? As night falls, Russia continues its advance, and people are taking shelter underground, in basements, parking garages, and subway stations. Twenty-seven-year-old Kristina Mazurchik works in a jewelry store. She tried to take shelter in a subway station close to her house, but it was completely full. So she's come here to the Kushatik station with her mom and sister. Today morning, I was supposed to go to work, but my phone and my mom told me that I'm very scared to go home. I didn't know if I should stay at home or what to do, so I decided to go to the metro. What do you think is going to happen in the coming days? When the invasion happened, my first thought was, okay, I'm not surprised that something is happening because we'd anticipated that for about two weeks. But what was it? It was the whole thing. Putin was going for broke. A multi-pronged invasion of the whole country. The invasion was swift and all-encompassing. A three-pronged attack from the north, south and east. Many analysts expected Ukraine to fall quickly. The most important strategic question at the beginning of the war was whether the Russians would actually take Kiev. I still believed that Russia would invade more in the periphery in the east and south, but would not go after the capital. But as I continued to watch the Russian invasion unfold, it became clear that Vladimir Putin in particular calculated he would get away with going after Kiev. 
The very first hours of the attack were based on the idea that the airborne troops would go into Hostomel Airport, take it, and they'd use that then as the jumping off point to get into the middle of the city, get hold of the government, kill Zelensky, take over the main lines of communication. And then with Hostomel Airport in their control, they could move more and more forces in more or less at will. Well, they did take Hostomel Airport, but they were driven off. The Ukrainians were able to retake it. And so the failure to take Kiev was the first big victory for the Ukrainians, the first battle of Kiev was one in which the Russians clearly lost. As Russia tried to advance on Kyiv, Ben Solomon travelled to the besieged suburbs of Irpin. After 12 days straight of bombing, residents were desperately fleeing. So this is the Irpin Bridge. As you can see, it's totally blown out. Hundreds of people are coming across these rickety bridges made from just the leftover wood and metal scraps from around this area where this bridge was destroyed. This is kind of the final cross between Kyiv city center and the suburbs where the majority of the fighting against the Russians have happened. These people have been stuck inside. Everybody here is desperate to get out. It's families, it's older people, it's disabled people. Anybody who can get out is trying to get out. People are bringing their pets. It's a really desperate scene. <laughs> This is the central park of the European. It looks like there was a tax on a bunch of the civilians here. You can see the bodies still lying out. It looks like these cars were, were pulling around here and a lot of them crashed. You can see they were being shot at. And then there's about three bodies still here, kind of left behind. One of them looks like he was shot in the head. Some of these other ones look like they've been pulled out of the cars. Oh, This conflict is not new to eastern Ukraine. Since 2014, Russia has occupied Crimea and there's been fighting in Donetsk and Luhansk for the past eight years. But the speed and force with which Russia targeted neighboring Kharkiv was still shocking. This is central Kharkiv and there are streets that have been completely destroyed like this all over the city. Most of the civilians have now moved underground or they've fled the city completely. This is a business center and there are buildings like this that have been destroyed everywhere you go. Kharkiv is the second city of Ukraine, very important city. It's very close to the Russian border. Well over 50% of the population of Kharkiv are Russian speakers. And the Russians must have felt that they could move into Kharkiv pretty quickly and easily. Well, they didn't. They surrounded it. And again, people in Kharkiv, just like people in Kiev, were prepared to fight. The Ukrainians managed to actually drive them out of artillery range so that although they bombarded the city quite a lot, they've since been driven away back towards their own Russian border. And in failing to take that second city, the Russians have actually shown the rest of the world what a tough job they're going to have in subduing a people who, even those who speak Russian, don't want to be Russian. Every day, missiles are falling on the city. Despite this, Volodymyr Gorbachev, the head of Kharkiv's rescue service and his team, continue to risk their lives to find survivors. Look Пойдемте наверх. 
Скажите, а аккуратно, везде стекла разбитые. So many people have left this city. Was it ever something that you considered fleeing from this war? Нет. Это мой город. Нам надо помогать. Мы служба спасения, мы помогаем людям. Если не мы, то помогать никто не будет. The city has a historical relationship with Russia. What is your feeling towards Russia now? Я не хочу о них думать. Сделали с нашим городом, с нашей Украиной люди близкие друг к другу. По нации, по духу. И у нас нет ничего общего. The very early initial intervention was not as brutal because the Kremlin expected a quick and easy victory, but when that did not happen, you can see the violence escalating. And so this war went from being something that might be over reasonably quickly to something that now seems to be relatively open-ended. Fundamentally, Vladimir Putin believes that Russia's loss in the Cold War was a tragedy that Russia had to reverse. So his invasion of Ukraine is not simply about Ukraine. It's about the idea that Ukraine is not a real country, that there is no such thing as the Ukrainian identity. But it's also about a fundamental remaking of the world. On the southern front, Putin had some early successes. Russia pushed north out of their positions in Crimea to occupy all the land up to the Dnipro River. By March 2nd, Russia captured Kherson. Kherson is the important city at the delta of the Dnieper River, and it's the only significant city that the Russians control. They then started to move westwards towards Odessa, but of course, to take Odessa, they had to take Mykolaiv first, and they didn't. The longer that Russians were stalled at Mykolaiv, the more punishing the airstrikes became. Isabel Young was on the ground as Putin quickly turned to his old playbook. What happened to your husband? What is his condition right now? У него сильная кровопотеря сейчас лежит в коме, в тяжелом состоянии. Теперь дедушку надо как-то подтягивать, потому что я без него не смогу. Александра's husband passed away a few days later. The casualties we met at the hospital came from just one single attack, lasting a matter of seconds. The blast shattered through a supermarket and a nearby apartment block. All the people were staying in a queue to the shop. They were waiting to go to the supermarket? Yeah, the supermarket to buy some food. Mikolaev's mayor, Oleksandr Sienkovich, had just arrived to assess the impact. This is a civilian apartment block. This is the place where the bomb Oh, wow. Yeah, you down. can see that. So this is the cluster bomb. We showed the remnants to several ammunition experts who confirmed this is a cluster bomb. These bombs spray dozens of bomblets across an area the size of an American football field. Some don't explode on first impact and act like landmines if they're stepped on. They're banned by most countries around the world given the high number of civilian casualties they cause. In this case, 13 civilians were badly injured, nine more died. And it's not an isolated incident. There's also evidence of cluster bombs being used in at least two other attacks across the city. Is this an unexploded one in the ground? Yeah, there is a one explode, unexploded just hit down. Oh, please don't touch. It must be very difficult for you as a mayor who you know has this big responsibility. It must be personally very difficult for you. Yeah, sure. But I'm trying not to think about it. It's war here, as you see. And what if the Russians come? What then happens We'll fight to you? with them. We will fight with them, we will kill them, because they are trying to kill us. Our families, our women, our parents, our children. Украинские нацисты готовят очередную бесчеловечную провокацию и для этого планируют. В ходе спецоперации раскрыты преступления нацистов на Украине. Зеленский, ты будешь идти на могилку к деду и рассказывать, 
что два года Киев был под нацистской оккупацией? When Vladimir Putin announced this quote-unquote special operation, he framed it in uh, a defensive narrative. It was the expansion of NATO, it was the aggression of the West that instilled in what he described as a fictitious, essentially, neo-Nazi government, and that Russia also had exercised utmost restraint. And only when security of its own people or its interests became threatened and when it exhausted all other options did Russia finally resort to limited military force. And a lot of Russians wonder why it's still called a special military operation, because in every other respect, this looks and feels like a war. And the idea that there is something um, limited about this has been wearing pretty thin now for about six months in Russia. It in fact became illegal. It was punishable by law, including imprisonment, to call this war anything than a special military uh, operation. Alec Loon saw firsthand how protesters and foreign press are handled when it comes to voicing opposition to the war. A man has just unfurled a anti-Putin poster here against the war. He's being arrested immediately. Police are not giving anyone even a minute to speak out or say anything critical of the war. The Russian government is stopping protests against the invasion of Ukraine before they can even start. They've also taken independent news outlets off the air banned publications from calling the war a war, and made spreading so-called false information about it punishable by up to 15 years in prison. Many foreign media suspended their reporting in Russia. Facebook and Twitter have been blocked. There's no question that the Russian population is being fed a steady diet of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda. It's not clear to what extent they are really aware, not only of how badly the war is going in Ukraine, but also the types of allegations that are being alleged against their compatriots who have been sent there to fight this war. Наш военкор Александр Сладков вместе с российскими военными у полностью окруженного Мариуполя. Трагедия в том, что националисты препятствуют мирным гражданам, превратив их в живой щит. Popular TV shows like this claim the military is defending Russian speakers against Ukrainian Nazis. One of the voices pushing that narrative is Maria Butina, who served 18 months in U.S. prison for conspiring to infiltrate the NRA and Republican political circles as a Russian agent. Now she's in parliament and voted to recognize the breakaway republics in eastern Ukraine. She's even been wearing the Z symbol that marks invading Russian tanks. Очень приятно. Очень приятно. А вы же американский канал, насколько я знаю. Да, да, да. Я называю это спецоперацией, поскольку это миротворческая операция, есть разница между войной и спецоперацией, поскольку основной задачей специальной операции является именно сберечь жизни мирных граждан, остановить геноцид, который происходил на протяжении многих лет, к сожалению, на Украине. Но если военная операция в Украине нацелена на то, чтобы сберечь мирных граждан, на, 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 ну, за, на мир, то как же так тогда, что сотни мирных граждан уже погибло там, да ты? Российские вооруженные силы не убивают мирных граждан. Российские вооруженные силы, вы можете видеть абсолютно массу всевозможных роликов в интернете, достоверной информации на официальных аккаунтах. Не доверяйте, пожалуйста, фейк-ньюс. Мы видим ролики, как бомбы падают на Харьков, на Суми, на Киев. На Российские вооруженные силы не применяют оружие против мирного населения. Не было много в мире, которые на момент. But this one did. Всем доброго ранку, украинцы. It was the moment when Zelensky went out on the streets after the invasion had started and filming himself with his cabinet and said, look, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here, he's here, the cabinet is here, we're all here. Никакую зброю мы не складемо, будемо захищати нашу державу, наші діти, і ми все це будемо захищати. And that convinced the world that Zelensky would fight that he would give up his life for this, that Ukraine was not going to roll over, the government would not give in immediately to this attempt by the Russians to take it all over in three days. And Putin, who spent most of the war locked away in the Kremlin, not seeing anyone, meeting people at the end of this ridiculously long table, Putin did himself no favors at all in looking like almost a cartoon dictator. And Zelensky is undoubtedly the man of the 21st century. 
President Zelensky survived several alleged assassination attempts in the first month alone. Though he and his family were constantly changing locations, Ben Solomon met Zelensky in a secret underground bunker to discuss Ukraine's resolve to keep fighting. It's a big, big tragedy and it's, it's a real war, but we are okay because we are understand for what we are fighting and we understand exactly with whom fighting is, you know, different, different time. When Russia occupied Crimea, it was very difficult for foreign people, for, for the world, for Europe and for United States, Britain to understand because they said that we are not there. It's not our soldiers. We didn't occupy any territories. We are not on Donbass. It's not it's the people, people, just people. They don't want to be with Ukraine. They want to be with Russia. So this, you know, this story is fairy tales. You, we heard a lot of them. And now, now it's more simple for us the world united around the Ukraine and now the world believes us very much and I'm happy but we lost eight years and lost about 20 uh, thousands people and our territories and now people see that it's exactly Russian soldiers and now at least the president of Russia says yes we are. Can you make a compromise with Putin? Can you trust Putin? Trust? Oh no, I trust only my family. I trust my family and my people. Now when we united our great, great people, great nation, I trust Ukrainians and so how, I don't know him how to trust. How can you make a deal with somebody you don't trust then? We have to, we have to, because to stop this war, how to stop this war? Only dialogue and only dialogue with him, he is the president of Russia. So, what would be your, your message to President Vladimir Putin right now? Right now? Right now, stop the war, begin to speak. That's it. I mean, President Zelensky is a world hero, right? He has stepped up into an incredible challenge. Meanwhile, we have Putin, who has launched what is so clearly a enormous strategic error. He's been run out everywhere and his troops are committing horrible abuses, all of which go up the chain of command and responsibility ultimately lies at his feet. And so I would hope that the Russian people would see this as well and understand that Putin has led them down a terrible, terrible pathway. Almost immediately after the launch of the war, we started to see evidence of war crimes. It's very clear that Russia is targeting elements of the civilian infrastructure, hospitals, for example, or a train station, schools, places where people are hiding. Any civilian facility that is targeted because it is a civilian facility or doesn't have a clear military rationale, that's a war crime. Entire villages have been often destroyed. Evidence of torture, credible reports of sexual violence, including against children and elderly people, men and women. Every area where Russia's forces have been, have been touched by violence and war crimes. Until just two months ago, this was 12-year-old Yulia's school. And this is a body here? Yeah. In our village, people died. A large number of people died in age, because they didn't have a After arriving here, Russian soldiers went door to door, taking hundreds of villagers from their homes and bringing them to this school. They forced them inside this basement, where they stayed for 25 days. The villagers believed they were used as human shields to protect the Russian military unit from Ukrainian bombs. What does this say on the door? Are you comfortable going down there? Are you sure? Yeah. You're very brave. I would have been absolutely terrified. Well, 
не, не очень бачить. Did you do these drawings up here? Да, я малювала и все Россия против Украины и в итоге победила Украина. No one knows exactly how many passed away while the Russians were here. The imprisoned villagers tried to keep count. Scratched into the wall to the right of this door are the names of the elderly who died. On the left are some of those who were killed. That list includes Anatoly Yanuk, or Tolik as he's known, a neighbor of Yulia's. Tolik is Katerina's nephew. Ми прийшли додому, і так в домі вже був просто все вибите. Посуда побита, машинку вони розбили. Вони просто відкривають шухляди, які можна які не добили, і гадять просто туди. Це не люди, це не люди. Я не знаю, звідки він їх копав той Путін їх. Ну це дикуни. What about your family? What happened with your nephew? Племянником він вечором ішов додому в той же день, коли вони вийшли в село. От, так сказали, що лежись. А Толік сказав, я на своїй землі, чого я буду лежитися? І йому вистріли все. And what about your son? He was here at the same time, right? І тоді вони його ночі питали, тому що в нього в шкафу був форма з Національної гвардії з академії. Ну, я стала кричати, просити, потім це саме страшне, що було. The Ukrainian prosecutor general has registered over 65,000 potential incidents of war crimes and other atrocities, and so will be engaged for many, many years after this conflict is over. The Ukrainian counteroffensive was very carefully thought through. First of all, the Ukrainians targeted the rear areas. They, they were given the technology, the longer range artillery and the rockets, so that they could actually cut the logistical supplies of Russian forces. They took back Izium, which is a very important center, and they then controlled the road and rail routes coming from Russia through to the Donbass. And they're now in a position to move around and retake large areas of Luhansk. We're just a few miles from Izium, which is one of the hardest and most dangerous front lines of the fight right now. The Russian forces are trying to encircle this area. They lose control here, then the Donbass could be circled, and all of the soldiers around there could be in trouble. All right, let's go. Go, 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 go. Ready? Go, go, go. go ahead, go ahead. Careful for the pipes. In this hidden bunker, two stories underground, yeah, these right. soldiers, surrounded on three sides, are one of the only units standing in the way of countless Russian tanks, artillery units, and soldiers. Is this pretty safe here? Oh, uh, it has been thus far. <laughs> As you can see, it's a pretty sturdy building. Denis Polishchuk, a Canadian-Ukrainian volunteer, is one of the hundreds of foreign fighters here. He was born in Ukraine and raised in Vancouver, and has been fighting on and off with no pay since 2014. Why do you do this? I'm originally from Ukraine. I dropped out of university to go fight in 2015, and now this, this unit is, is close and dear to my heart. Is it dangerous here? Is it hard to work here? The enemy positions are very close by. It's kind of the luck of the draw every, every single time you, you go outside. What is it like for the soldiers living here under all the shelling and attacks in this basement? It does take a toll on you after a while. You can definitely see it in the eyes of the soldiers who spent more than a couple of weeks here. At the same time, though, we're on our own land. We're doing what we came here to do. There's nobody here that really doesn't want to be here. We had two, uh, two of my buddies were injured uh, yesterday out there. They, uh, they crawled in here to find more for cover. How are they? One's in a coma, the one who lost his leg, the 18-year-old. And that was just here, just right outside? Yeah, just, just outside, yeah. This war is now a battle for position. Ukrainian forces are on the defensive, trying to slow the Russian advance. But they try to take a breather when they can. <laughs> But it's never long between Russian attacks. This position is now under direct fire. We just got an incoming shell that just hit right above us. 
the entire building shift. It seems like the Russians know where this place is and they're firing on it right now. For six straight hours, Russians fired hundreds of tank shells on the position. These guys are saying they're pinned down right now. We haven't been able to get out. The shelling has been really intensive all around here. Finally, there was a lull in the shelling for us to make our escape. So it was a very successful double offensive, and it gave the Ukrainians some real momentum and made the Russians dig in. It made the Russians effectively stop fighting to hold on to what they had while they waited for all their reinforcements, which will arrive during 2023. Throughout the summer, Ukraine continued to make advances during the counteroffensive. So in September, Putin announced a so-called partial mobilization, drafting hundreds of thousands of young troops. While we focus so much on Ukrainian victims, we should not lose sight of the fact that Putin is deploying young Russian men into battle, unprepared, untrained, with insufficient equipment, and they're dying in droves. These are essentially cannon fodder. The Russian people don't know the full truth about casualties. If your son or your husband or your father dies, oftentimes they, they, they simply don't know what happened. They, they're not notified immediately. There's simply no news for a long time to come. The Russian army is trying to get 300,000 new soldiers by the end of the month. Regular places have been turned into draft centers. This Moscow theater processes around 100 new recruits a day. <laughs> These young men will replace some of the tens of thousands of soldiers already killed or injured in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I feel a sense of pride for the country, for my family, that I have not left this for a long time, and I have taken such a responsibility to protect my family. Some people are still motivated by the lies President Vladimir Putin has told to justify the war. But others aren't happy about being forced to enlist and the mood is sullen. A stark contrast to the heroic tone of the Soviet-era war films playing in the background. Speaking critically of the war is a criminal offence, so it's hard to know how any of these conscripts truly feel. <laughs> Что-то тоже осталось какой-то, возможно, патриотизм. Раз а я все-таки не сбежал. Какой исход видите для России, для специальной военной операции? У меня нет такой специальности, чтобы еще что-то предвидеть, говорить и так далее. Я вот, например, вполне себе не знал, что произойдет то, что назовут сейчас спецоперацией. Vitaly was given a draft notice and less than 24 hours to report for duty. Ну, отец у меня живет, считай, в другом городе Одинцове. С ними не успел попрощаться. С родными остальными тоже не успел попрощаться. Это если родители стоят рядом поцеловать щечку, только на все про все у нас будет ну три минуты. Moments before the bus leaves, Vitaly's father arrives. Я так вот смотрел по телевизору, вот, вот в регионах там и каски выдают, и бронежилеты. А здесь он даже вот свой пояс говорит. То есть получается, что не, как то не продумано здесь. Это Москва. Until today, this center didn't even have bags for the recruits, but these men are far better equipped than some. Multiple videos circulating online seem to show fresh recruits carrying rusty rifles, being told to bring their own makeshift medical kit, and even being sent to the front lines with no training. We officially said that the preparation for the zone of action will not be done. Но дело в том, что я один, это, у меня от его как это, жена у него, и, и, и действие сын стало. Вот, вот это у меня последнее, что это. А так то, ну, конечно, долго надо отдать. Просто так неожиданно, что это вчера это вот дали, сегодня уже это забирают. The Russians have tried to conduct two types of war since the beginning of the operation. 
The first type was where they used armoured forces with infantry and support and artillery and air power together to achieve military objectives and move forward. And they've completely failed. That changed on the 10th of October because then the new commander was Solovikin. And Solovikin decided a new form of warfare was begun, which was to attack the critical national infrastructure of Ukraine with bombs and missiles and, and aircraft. Sorovikin was nicknamed as a butcher for a very good reason. He was unforgiving of his own subordinates, and he was absolutely unforgiving of anyone on the ground who got in his way. It seemed that he was appointed because that is the type of hand that would help Russia gain an upper hand on the military battlefield, that type of cruelty, that type of violence. This type of warfare has taken a devastating toll on civilians and soldiers alike. Isabel Young visited a rehab center on the outskirts of Kyiv, where there's been a threefold increase in the number of patients, and staff are struggling to keep up with demand. So how are you guys getting on? How does it feel to have the new leg? I mean, obviously, there is pressure to seem tough in front of everyone, but I mean, how much trauma is there in the military? How much is it that soldiers are going through right now? Have you guys received any psychiatric help at all? Anyone to help you talk through these experiences? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a long rehabilitation process, but when that's done, will you guys head back to the front? This trauma will be intergenerational. I mean, to have your neighborhood attacked brutally, unprovoked, people were living their lives, ordinary lives like the rest of us dream of living, and yet brutally interrupted. Life paths, decisions about marriages and school and what I want to be when I grow up, all of this has been disrupted by this conflict. Civilians who remained in the city of Bakhmut have lived this reality almost daily. For months, Bakhmut has been the epicenter of intense fighting. Russian forces, including the notorious paramilitary Wagner Group, who maintain close ties to President Putin, are determined to take the city. While most families have escaped the violence here, some families have chosen to stay behind. Eight-year-old Sonia is one of the last kids living in the center of the city. For nine months, she and her parents have been living under heavy and constant shelling. So this is Mama? Yes. This is your brother? This is family. Yeah. Friends. Why do you keep water right here? That's scary if that happens. What do you tell Sonia about what's going on? Are you scared for Sonia here? Are you scared of what she's seeing and what she's experiencing? Why are you staying in Bakhmut? Все у нас здесь, понимаете? Все родное, все здесь. То есть уезжать отсюда, это значит, это значит потерять себя. 
пока есть силы, пока есть возможности, мы остаемся здесь. Если бы еще не, не стреляли вот это вот, целый день, слышите, что бы он был. Ну, еще когда так судьи. I think that when Russia began the invasion of Ukraine, it was hard for many in the West to fully appreciate the global reverberations of this war. We've seen rising prices everywhere. We've seen global instability everywhere. Conflicts that are cropping up around the world because the, the globe is distracted and focused so intently on the situation in Ukraine. This war is likely to become far more mobile. It will become much more intense. It'll be much nastier. It will be much more dangerous to the outside world. This war is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. As Ukraine braces for renewed fighting in the spring, Russia has nearly surrounded Bakhmut. It's unclear how long Ukraine can hold the city. And it's civilians like Sonia and her family who will suffer the most as this war drags on. <laughs> So what's it like living down here? Ну, в принципе, я уже привыкла так. Я уже так привыкла, то, что нам отключают. В принципе, я нахожу себе работу там. Теперь мне не с кем погулять, не с кем пообщаться там. Я поднимаюсь иногда и спрыгиваю. То есть, что там? Там, например, так. Это у нас бак с водой, с водой там мама здесь моет посуду, здесь еще у нас лежит пища, там роллы всякие, суп роллы, острая лапша роллы, ну и батончики всякие. They've been coming here more and more as shelling increases around the city, doing everything they can to make it feel like home. So what is the first thing you're gonna do when the war is over? Я хочу пойти первое, первое в парк, видеть, услышать тишину, то есть быть выстраивают новые дома там. В моей стране мне бы хотелось мира. I'm Michael Lermont, editor in chief of Vice News. Too often traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.